this for a, a bit longer. Um, so with no further ado, I, I definitely want to hand it over to Deirdre for, the, for talking about what's going on in the clusters 20. And I gave him a special dispensation allowing him to use PowerPoint, which for those of you who know is usually forbidden, but um, sounds like he didn't have a document camera, but, uh, but please take it away. Go ahead. And people will most certainly, will probably take a pause at some point and ask for questions if you haven't received any as you go. Um, but we'll just we'll just go ahead and go. I think otherwise, yeah. So go ahead. Floor is That's yours. entirely fine. Thank you so much, and and thank you so much for for having me here today. Thanks all for coming. Thanks for having had this uh, amazing program over the past few weeks on uh, global clusters. Uh, I'll start sharing my screen now. By the way, uh, it's been a, a fantastic couple of weeks, and I think uh, that was also the the sentiment across. Uh, yeah, the entire group of people we've had together over those weeks. Uh, we've made concrete progress uh, on, on several exciting areas. And what I'll try to do is not necessarily talk about that specific progress that we've made over the past five weeks, uh, but I'll try to give a little bit of, a, of an overview of the field of, of globular cluster formation and evolution studies uh, in the context of galaxy formation and evolution, which is the topic of our meeting. And uh, I'll, I'll try to give a, a sort of an overview of that and at some point go in more into the uh, details of what we've been trying to do in that context uh, with our team. Uh, but before I go there, uh, I already said we had an amazing meeting. Uh, I specifically want to thank the organizers, so uh, Laura Sales, Oleg Nedin, and uh, Aaron Romanowski for bringing this group together and also, of course, the KITP for having hosted us. I think especially under the current circumstances, it's wonderful that we've been able to have this meeting. So onto globular clusters. Um, basically, the, the concept of this meeting was, can we understand how globular clusters are both the products of star and galaxy formation, and maybe also how do they trace star and galaxy formation, how they might be the relics of star and galaxy formation across cosmic history. And that is, is sort of the broad topic I would like to speak about, the origins of global clusters across cosmic time. And I thought it would be nice to start with the movie that you see here in the background. Thank you for the dispensation. Movies are only possible this way. My drawing skills are not fast enough to draw a movie on a blackboard. Uh, but what you see here is a cosmological simulation. And uh, in this cosmological simulation, it's a, one of a kind in that sense, is we can trace the individual stellar clusters that form in the simulation and trace them as they dissolve across cosmic history to go from sort of big bang initial conditions to a redshift zero galaxy like the Milky Way and try and figure out how its global cluster system formed. And these simulations and also a lot of the work that I'll show during this talk has not only been by me, but by a large group of people and specific names are here on the right. Uh, but also the names who have been either participating uh, in this meeting or, or would have probably liked to participate are highlighted in bold. So Martha Rana Campos, Sebastian Triolo Gomez were here, uh, also Nate Bastian and Megan Hughes. Joel Pfeffer uh, probably should have joined uh, as uh, one of the lead uh, authors of uh, the simulations you see here, but he's in Australia and that complicated things. So without further ado, uh, these are, again, are, are the same uh, people largely who I highlighted before. Uh, without further ado, let me go into context here. So um, what you see here is a cosmological simulation on an even larger scale. This is uh, on, on many megaparsec scales. What you see here is the cosmic web and the formation of galaxies in action in this simulation from the illustrious team. And I basically want to step through this because if we want to understand where globular clusters came from and how they might trace galaxy assembly, this is sort of the biggest picture that we should have in mind. So what you see here is that along filamentary structures of the cosmic web, gas flows towards galaxies. And in those galaxies, the gas forms stars and feeds supermassive black holes at the very centers. And together, those stars and the supermassive black holes eject impart momentum and energy onto the surrounding gaseous medium. And that process is called feedback. And that is what is driving all of those bubbles coming out of those galaxies. And that process, the, basically the uh, interaction between gravity pulling things in and then feedback trying to blow things out again is what regulates galaxy formation and evolution, as you can see very nicely here. But as you zoom in further, 
in individual galaxies, the same process takes place. But now not on the galactic scale, but within galaxies, within sort of little clouds of gas, molecular clouds, where stars form. You see here on the side, you see how gas is being blown out of the galaxy by pockets of young star formation, and then forms the circumgalactic medium from which it will later then cool, come back into the galaxy and form stars again. And this is what in astrophysics we call the baryon cycle. And that baryon cycle, as you can see, just by those two movies, is a multi-scale process. It acts on scales of the cosmic web, but also down to the individual clouds in galaxies. And within those clouds, the stars that form there, some of those stars end up in dense stellar clusters. And the most massive of those we typically refer to as globular clusters. And they're so massive and so dense that they can survive for effectively all of cosmic history. And that is what this workshop largely has been about. So if we want to understand this galaxy formation and assembly process, there are basically three ways in which we can try and understand it. The main challenge is that galaxy formation and assembly mostly took place at high redshift, and I'll show an explicit example of that later. And what that means is to directly probe the galaxy formation and assembly process, we need to look at high redshift galaxies early in the, early, in the history of the universe. And that requires observations of extreme sensitive, sensitivity and resolution, and that is often very challenging. But that is, in principle, the first way in which you can constrain this process. The other way is to try and look in the local universe for analogs, like maybe galaxies merge in the local universe, giving rise to similar conditions to those that we saw at high redshift, and maybe we can use that to infer how galaxies formed and assembled. And then the third way of doing this is something we call galactic archaeology, which is basically where we use the old products of this high redshift star and galaxy formation process and use them as fossils to figure out what the conditions were like in the early universe and how galaxies formed and evolved. And that is, again, what this program was about. Because globular clusters, and I'm showing here an example, globular clusters are these relics. So here you see a Hubble Space Telescope image of one of those globular clusters with an incredibly rich reservoir of stars that basically each individually hold information as to what the history is of this cluster. And then for a population of such clusters, they hold information on what the history was of the host galaxy. And as we look around in the local universe, we see globular clusters in pretty much all galaxies with stellar masses larger than about 100 million solar masses. So here in the bottom right, this is not a globular cluster. This is actually a galaxy. And every dot here is a globular cluster, where which here in the top shows an example from the Milky Way, the example that I just showed on the previous slide. And the questions that we've been trying to address over the past weeks, and basically the main questions in this field of research are as follows. The first is, what are the physical mechanisms that shape these globular cluster populations that we see at rich of zero? Where, where do they come from? And, and what gives rise to this enormous richness of those globular cluster populations? And then second, can those globular clusters somehow tell us something about how the host galaxy formed and evolved? And these are really the questions that we've been interested in. A lot of people are interested in globular clusters for other reasons, because they're really fundamental astrophysical laboratories. For instance, they're the densest stellar systems in the universe, so they are excellent tests of uh, gravitational interactions, pure dynamics. Because many of them are old, they potentially played a role in reionization, which interests a lot of people. They might be probes of dark matter theories, for instance, if they each formed in their own dark matter halo. And because of their extreme stellar dynamics, they're factories of uh, black holes and black hole in spirals, so gravitational wave events. And for that reason, people are also interested in knowing where globular clusters came from. Okay, so before I continue now, I would like to reiterate what Lars already said before, is if anybody wants to interrupt me, by all means do so. That's entirely fine. Okay. Uh, so I, have, I, have one, I have one okay. question. This is Mark. Um, is there an unambiguous definition of a globular cluster? Exactly. Next slide. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Great question. So this is exactly where I was about to, to arrive. Uh, indeed. How, how, before we continue, how do we define a globular cluster? And in the field, the definition I'm showing here is the one that's mostly used. So you know one when you see one. The one on the right here, everybody would agree, is a globular cluster. 
But by and large, there was a bunch of criteria that most people would roughly agree on. Globular clusters are typically old, of the order 10 giga years. Um, but, you know, that's not the only thing. They're also massive, of, of the order 100,000 stars. Uh, they're usually sitting in a sort of a spheroidal configuration around the host galaxy uh, in, in sort of a halo shape. They're largely metal poor. So what that means is they most of them have chemical compositions like metallicities lower than that of the sun. And this is something that has drawn a lot of attention in recent years. Globular clusters are said to host multiple stellar populations. So most stellar clusters that we see forming today are formed all at once. So their chemistry and their age are homogeneous. And for globular clusters, we can't really tell age. That's observationally is very difficult. But chemically, we can tell that they have multiple distinct populations with different, different chemical abundances. Now, the issue is with all of those definitions is that exceptions exist to all of them. There are young globular clusters. There are low mass globular clusters. There are galaxies sitting close or globular clusters sitting close to the galactic center. There are ones that have metallicities higher than solar metallicity. And there are also ones that actually don't have multiple populations. So this makes this all a little bit challenging. And when you get when you're in the Venn diagram, you're at the spot where all of those are satisfied and everybody agrees it's a globular cluster. But you can get into very nasty, partially semantic discussions once you step out. But either way, this is roughly the working definition that we'll go with. And May I ask a question? Sorry. Just, yeah, just when means. you have a multiple, this is Christina. Hi. When hi, you have hi. multiple stellar populations, are these distributed? uniformly throughout the cluster or are they so that too differs that differs between clusters i see so there are clusters where you know there are typically two populations there are clusters where one of them is more centrally concentrated and there are clusters where it's the other one and what about, what about temperature uh, the temperatures of the stars are effectively just set by their age and yeah. by their mass and that that effectively yeah, governs everything. There is no, nothing uh, unusual in that regard. I see. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, so this this plurality of of uh, definitions, but also exceptions, uh, sort of suggests that you know maybe there is multiple ways of forming a globular clusters. Maybe it's some some convergence avenue, or maybe there's one way. And either way, people have been asking the question: Where do globular clusters come from? And historically, this has mostly been something that I call fla the flavor of the decade. And what that means is it's been guided by recent discoveries at that moment in time that has led to globular cluster formation theories. So for instance, when in the mid 60s, the intergalactic medium was discovered, it was suggested that maybe globular clusters formed in that intergalactic medium because intergalactic medium was observed to be hot uh, the high temperature led to a high mass for thermal instability, and people thought, well, maybe that would then naturally lead to uh, globular clusters. This was later uh, ruled out because low mass galaxies, dwarf galaxies, like the one you see here in the bottom right, have globular clusters, but they don't have very hot halos. And therefore, that can't be uh, the, at least not the only formation. Then in the 90s, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope started observing galaxy mergers in the local universe, like the one you see here. And all of those blue bits here are extremely hot, hot and young, massive stellar clusters, pretty much like globular clusters, but they're forming today. And that is a key thing. They're very massive, very dense, of the, all the properties that we only knew of these old globular clusters. But here we saw them forming today. And therefore, people said, well, maybe they formed in major mergers. And again, that was ruled out because of low mass galaxies, which never had those major collisions with other galaxies, but they still had globular clusters. Then as the standard dark matter halo uh, profile uh, uh, was established in the late 90s, in the 2000s, people proposed, well, maybe globular clusters formed in their own dark matter halos. And people have looked for those and didn't find any evidence of dark matter, not even in the outskirts of the globular clusters where you would expect to uh, detect it better. And for that reason, that is now also disfavored. And then finally, uh, in the, the sort of the later part of the beginning of this century, uh, 
uh, people started finding uh, what they called ultra compact dwarf galaxies, which were extremely massive, massive globular clusters, uh, effectively. But people thought, okay, well, these are the likely the former nuclei of dwarf galaxies, which were tidally stripped by tidal forces, and then only the nucleus would remain. So could globular clusters maybe the nuclei of those systems. And again, this was ruled out because all of those nuclei have chemical abundance spreads in iron. So all of their stars have different iron abundances. And for globular clusters, that's not true. Uh, and the other problem was that there are basically not enough dwarf galaxy nuclei in the universe to come up with the entire globular cluster budget. So this is effectively 50 years of globular cluster theories, and none of them seems to have worked completely. Now, one thing one might notice about all of those theories is that they relied on special, some form of special physics, like special conditions in the early universe that might promote globular cluster formation or, or some specific mechanism. And of course, the question to ask is, okay, is, is this the only way? And my answer, and I think with me, a lot of the uh, people who were participating in the meeting over the past weeks, is, is this the only way? Is this the only way we could address this problem? And the answer in the field is, at the moment, is, is no, there, there is another way. And the other way is by looking at the properties of globular clusters at, at the present day and trying to figure out under which conditions they might have formed. And what I'm showing here is uh, the distribution of the globular cluster population of the Milky Way in the age versus metallicity plane, so age versus chemical composition. So to the right is old, and to the top is higher metallicity. So the, the sun uh, basically formed where my mouse is here. And one thing we notice immediately is that most of those globular clusters have very old ages. They formed at a redshift of about three or about 12 giga years ago. And what that means is, is that globular clusters formed only just before the peak of the cosmic star formation history. So this is the cosmic star formation history. We are here with redshift zero, and the cosmic star formation history peaked at redshift two. And globular clusters typically formed in this red bit here, where, where I colored the range red, that's where globular clusters form. And what that means is that globular clusters did not form here around galaxies in, in those sort of quiet halos outside galaxies where we see them, but they formed here in extremely gas-rich, high-pressure disks of high redshift galaxies. That is where, at the time, that is what the galaxy population looked like. And a key physical ingredient that is important to take away here is that the gas pressures that we observe in those galaxies, so effectively the kinetic energy densities, are many orders of magnitude higher than what we see in galaxies forming stars in the local universe today. And that will come back in a bit. Because if we look in the local universe at a couple of galaxies that achieve similarly high gas pressures and are similarly gas rich and have high star formation rates, we see that those galaxies are actually forming stellar clusters with properties very similar to globular clusters. The only difference is, is that they're young, they're forming today. And an example is shown here. So on the left is what everybody would agree on as a globular cluster. So it is 400,000 solar masses. It's about, has a radius of about two parsecs. And here on the right is a cluster that only just formed a couple of mega years ago. It's a million solar masses and it has a radius of just a parsec and a half. There is nothing in terms of like the, the mass or the radius, the density, nothing that really sets them apart. So that should make us ask a question. This is effectively Occam's razor. In the local universe, we see globular cluster-like clusters forming wherever the gas pressure is high and the star formation rate is high. And we know that both of these quantities, the gas pressure and the star formation rate, peaked near the globular cluster formation redshift, around redshift two or three. Well, then the first questions we should ask should really be, is it possible that the products of regular cluster formation at high redshift have survived until the present day? And if so, are those relics consistent with the properties of local globular cluster populations? Now, these are really simple questions to ask. They're really hard to answer because they require an end-to-end -end model for globular cluster formation and evolution in a cosmological context. And that is supremely challenging. Because basically what it requires is, it requires 
some description of star formation and then telling you exactly what part of that star formation goes into clusters and what their initial masses are, what their initial distribution of masses is. It needs to describe how those clusters then dissolve over cosmic history and, and which of them might survive under which conditions. And all of this needs to be put in a context of galaxy formation, basically the cosmic web that I showed at the beginning and show, and show how the clusters are redistributed as galaxies collide and hierarchically grow. So to, to summarize this graphically, we need to go from the cosmic web here, follow the accretion onto individual galaxies as we see here, and then zoom into individual gas clouds within those galaxies where stars form, and some of those stars will be in clusters and understand why they're forming clusters. And then model them forward in time and understand how those clusters dissolve with time until eventually we get globular clusters like the one here in the bottom left. And then, as I mentioned that too, we want to understand how those systems trace galaxy formation, what they can tell us about the galaxy formation process. And this is why it is such a fascinating topic. It connects all of those scales, all of those different physical processes. And that is why we just had a program with 100 people talking about this for five weeks. Uh, could I just ask a quick question? Uh, yeah, sure. Very naive from, from biophysicist, Ulrich is my name. Um, I was just wondering regarding the properties of these clusters, you, you mentioned a couple of, of things, but you didn't mention angular momentum. So, so ah. when I naively sort of saw these objects and I thought maybe they're just globular because they don't have, I mean, for some chance reason, basically angular momentum as well. Is that so they have, they have very little angular momentum. It's a very good question. And basically the reason they have uh, little angular momentum is that the uh, in gravitational interaction between the stars redistributes the angular momentum and basically drives, uh, it, it's, it's a process we call relaxation. And also during the formation already, which you see here in the bottom right, uh, the stars form along filaments, which all fall in, and then they undergo violent relaxation as they merge. And that process, uh, um, basically causes the individual stellar orbits to become isotropic. And that is eventually what gets rid of most of the angular momentum. There is evidence for uh, residual rotation in a lot of globular clusters, and we see that that residual rotation uh, uh, shows up mostly at the high mass end of the population. So it seems that more massive globular clusters retain more rotation and are even a little bit flattened but by and large, in the spherical structure is, is ubiquitous. Does okay. that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, but in, in, in the, the, the fact that they are globular is not just because they happen to have no angular momentum, this is sort of more... You know... Right, but, but their formation process, as you see on the bottom right, mm -hmm. it's not very big, but uh, it, it is a hierarchical process. And what that means is uh, there, there is, uh, it, it is not an organized, process. Let me, let me put it that way. Mm -hmm. And that means that, sure, there will be residual angular momentum initially, but it's then the gravitational interactions of the stars within the cluster that erases that. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. You're welcome. Um, okay. So a first attempt that I personally made to tackle this complexity of different processes that come together, uh, I made in 2015. And I called it a shaken then stirred model. Uh, for globular cluster formation. And it, it basically works as follows. You, so you start with a galaxy that I'm showing here on the top left, in which young, massive clusters form. And the first thing those clusters do is they will be orbiting within the disk of the host galaxy. And during that time, they will encounter a lot of gas clouds that are also orbiting in that galaxy. And they will undergo gravitational perturbations from those gas clouds. And these we call tidal shocks. And I'll show an example in a moment. And it's believed that those tidal shocks can be very efficient at disrupting the stellar clusters. Because basically what happens during such a gravitational interaction is you inject energy into that cluster, which then unbinds stars from that cluster and causes it to lose stars. Well, that phase continues until somehow the clusters are thrown out of the galaxy. And a viable process for that is galaxy mergers. So when two galaxies merge, then the clusters are, are typically, the, the galaxies are perturbed, uh, material within the disks of the galaxies can be thrown out, and that then could naturally explain why they're sitting in sort of these halo-like structures at the present day. Now, once they're sat in the halo then, 
they still lose uh, stars. That is exactly because of these interactions between stars that I just mentioned, call that evaporation. But that's a relatively slow process. It's important to account for, but by and large, most of the mass would then have been lost here in this early phase of rapid disruption. And as you fast forward in time, the idea of this model is that you would end up with the globular cluster populations that you see today. Now, this, in this context, I'd like to briefly go over the different efforts that have been carried out focusing on understanding globular cluster formation. And in that context, what I should highlight is at the time in, in, in 2015, this uh, uh, bit on, on the left here was new. Most models uh, at, at that time had attempted to understand globular clusters by looking at the bit on the right and, and adding the tidal shock driven disruption and the formation environment and the migration uh, was something that I think now five years later was a relevant addition because it turns out a lot of the properties of globular clusters are set at that time. Okay, so there have been a variety of techniques focusing on parts of this timeline to, to see how they work. And one that is quite recent but extremely promising is to do numerical simulations of cluster formation in high redshift galaxies to, to resolve the clusters forming. I'm showing an example here on the right where these are not quite yet, but almost individual stars that you see here. And these extremely high resolution simulations show that indeed under those conditions that we see at high redshift, you can form globular cluster-like clusters. And that's really is a necessity, of course, for any, any of this picture to work. A second class of models uh, that has been very successful and is probably the oldest among the class of models that I, I'm showing here is semi-analytic models of galaxy formation. And what these basically do is they take a merger tree, like what you see here on the bottom right, showing all kinds of galaxies that grow as the, the black here widens and at some point merge into a single galaxy uh, as we go down with time. And these types of merger trees are taken from dark matter only simulations like the Millennium simulation. And then effectively you can paint on galaxies and you can paint on stellar clusters, or at least the properties of stellar clusters that you expect to see, okay, what, what do their properties look like at the end of the process? And this includes cluster migration through mergers because the mergers are included explicitly. It has population statistics at the end, which is great. Uh, but not all models include uh, disruption. If they do, it's mostly by evaporation. And not all models include a description for cluster formation. So another uh, approach that's being used is by taking galaxy formation simulations and tagging uh, globular clusters onto it. So in those simulations, there were particles that follow the matter flow. It can basically, you can select a subset of particles and call them globular clusters and follow them around. And again, this accounts for migration and the population statistics, sometimes has a little bit of formation, but just tagging doesn't do the cluster disruption. So even if you know which clusters form, you don't know which ones survive. So that then poses a problem too. But again, this is useful to try and get the population statistics, see how, how those processes work, and has led to a lot of insight over the years, again, spanning sort of a 20 year baseline here of research. Then uh, I think this is the, the final example I want to highlight. What people have been trying to do is take orbits of individual stellar clusters and run direct embody simulations of those stellar clusters to follow them around in the gravitational potential of the host galaxy and that way figure out how quickly they lose stars. Now, some of those simulations include cluster migration. So they basically follow a cluster during a galaxy merger, for instance. Um, and, and they're very good at modeling the, the evaporation-driven disruption of stellar clusters, uh, giving rise to what you see here in the bottom left, those beautiful tidal streams. These are stars that are basically torn tidally from the stellar clusters as they dissolve and orbit the host galaxy here. But what they're, where they struggle is getting uh, the population statistics of the globular clusters. And obviously also formation is not included here. This is just looking at a cluster and seeing how it dissolves. So this is a rough overview of what had been done until a couple of years ago. And I think what it shows is, is a very important point, is if we want to understand, and that usually comes by producing or reproducing observed globular cluster populations, models must either include all of those ingredients or make assumptions about the missing steps. And of course, it is a goal to include all ingredients in this field. We need physical models for everything. 
And of course, that doesn't mean we will get everything right at all. But that's the point. That's how you learn and that's how we improve our physical understanding. So I'd like to step through uh, these processes and, 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 and to the, through this cycle effectively and show how we've been making pro progress in this area. And the framework of, of this example that I'm going to give is the eMosaic simulations. And what we've done in eMosaics, we've, we've taken the cosmological volume of the Eagle galaxy formation simulations, which is shown here. So this is showing the dark matter distribution. And the first thing we did here is we selected 25 Milky Way mass stellar, uh, Milky Way mass galaxies, shown here in the, in the yellow circles. And then we ran cosmological zoom-in simulations of these, where we included a subgrid model for the uh, formation and evolution of the stellar cluster population. And the philosophy here has been to basically apply everything we know about star cluster formation and disruption to see if we could uh, reproduce the observed globular cluster population. And the idea has been to use the physics that we see happening in the local universe today and apply it across cosmic history to see if that then indeed would both reproduce both populations. So both the clusters we see forming today and the clusters that may have, may have formed uh, 10 giga years ago. And basically, if you run those zoom-in simulations, which you see here on the right, as you zoom in, and here in this panel, you see all the colored dots. These are individual globular clusters that we see then in those simulations and describe with this subgrid model. And here in another other panel, is showing stills from the movie I showed earlier, going to the right as a function of cosmic time as the galaxy assembles. And here's that movie again. So basically what this does is it takes as I mentioned, it takes cluster formation and evolution models, couples them to the Eagle galaxy formation physics, and that allows us really for the first time to follow the formation and evolution of the entire stellar cluster population across cosmic history. And that is exciting because it, if, if we reproduce the global cluster population at redshift zero, we can learn something about how it formed. But not just that, we can also learn something about how their properties might tell us something about how the host galaxy assembled. And that is basically what we've been trying to do. So this is a brief overview of what it does uh, schematically. So the EAGLE model is a suite of cosmological hydrodynamical galaxy formation simulations, which describes the hydrodynamics of the gas, the dynamics of the gas, stars, and dark matter, and the stellar evolutions, the stars uh, reaching the ends of their lives, enriching uh, the surrounding medium with chemical elements, losing mass, and so on. And then in addition, we add this subgrid stellar cluster formation evolution model called mosaics, which describes as a function of the local cosmic environment, how, many, how much of the star formation goes into stellar clusters, what is their initial mass distribution, and so on. And in addition then, if we have those stellar clusters, how do they disrupt over cosmic history? So let me start with the first bit here. I'll give a very top level summary of how this works. The first step here is going from the galaxy to the cluster formation here on the bottom right. So the first question you need to address is what fraction of the star formation happening in a galaxy goes into stellar clusters? And that is what we call the cluster formation efficiency. And on the left here is shown a model showing how the uh, cluster formation efficiency changes as a function of the local gas surface density in a galaxy, which is effectively as a probe for the gas pressure. And the prediction here is that it increases with the gas pressure. So at high gas pressures, more stars are forming in stellar clusters. It's effectively it's more compressed. That's a way of visualizing this. On the right is showing observational measurements of young cluster populations in the local universe showing that indeed we see observationally the cluster formation efficiency increases here with the star formation rate surface density. It's not quite the gas surface density, but these two are related and both trace underlying uh, the gas pressure. So these two are in agreement and we've placed that in e-mosaics. Clusters form according to this recipe, so, you, so to say. And this is what e-mosaics then predicts. So this is showing the cluster formation efficiency for all stars forming in one of those Milky Way mass simulations as a function of redshift or cosmic look back time. And what we see is that this cluster formation efficiency increases towards higher redshift and earlier times in the history of the universe. 
And what that means is that most globular clusters formed when galaxies were good at forming clusters. And that is an excellent, promising result, right? It gives us, gives us some confidence that we're going into the right direction. So if we now have some amount of mass going into clusters, we need to know what their initial cluster mass function looks like. What is their mass distribution? And observationally, uh, we see that that mass distribution shown here follows a power law with an index of minus two and then a truncation at the high mass end where it sort of bends over. Now from theory, it follows that this slope of minus two is basically an inevitable result of self-similar growth, of gravitational fragmentation and hierarchical collapse. This maximum mass scale uh, in, in recent years has been shown by uh, Marta Rana Campos here and Sebastian Trijillo Gomez, who have both been participating in this workshop. Uh, this maximum mass scale comes from the competition between gravity, wanting to attract more material, and galactic shearing motions, galactic dynamics, and feedback from the stellar cluster that wants to pull things away. And that competition determines how massive the most massive stellar cluster can become. And that is what, in the end, sets this maximum mass scale. So this, again, we've placed in e-mosaics. And if we then look at how that maximum mass scale evolves with cosmic history, you see the same behavior, which is that Globular clusters formed here towards the right when more massive clusters could assemble. And this is again is promising because globular clusters are massive. They're the most extreme stellar clusters that we know. Okay, so that is the part on globular cluster formation or stellar cluster formation in general in, in e-mosaics. Now the next question is, is how do they question. evolve? So yep. let me, this is Lars. So can you, can you say a little bit about um, I mean, you mentioned the fact that the clusters have no evidence for dark matter being concentrated within them. Um, yep. Presuming that just naturally falls out of everything you've just told us. Yes, right, exactly. So what the working assumption is of uh, e-mosaics is that globular clusters are the natural byproducts of star formation. Yep. And then the question is, okay, if, we, if, if making that assumption, which is the Occam's razor zeroth order assumption that I, that I mentioned at the beginning, is if that works and if that successfully reproduces globular clusters, then maybe that tells us something. That's the assumption. It doesn't necessarily mean that all globular clusters form that way. Uh, it is possible that there is a plurality of formation mechanisms. But if this approach manages to reproduce the observed demographics well, and it's really important to not look at a single favorite observable, but at, at all of them, then I would argue it probably means it's the dominant mode of globular cluster formation. So that's the philosophy, basically. Great, thank you. Cool, thank you. Pause see if there's other questions at this point. Yeah. Okay, okay forward ahead. I'll continue. So the next question is how globular clusters dissolve. And as I mentioned, the dominant disruption mechanism is tidal shocking by dense gas. So in the uh, inset here on the bottom right, you see a typical star forming galaxy. And if a globular cluster is orbiting in this galaxy, it encounters all of those gas structures. And when it encounters a gas structure, something happens that you see here. So this is a gas structure passing with a direct embody simulation of a stellar cluster. And you see the stars are flying away from each other. And that is because that interaction tidally injects energy into the cluster and therefore unbinds a lot of the stars. And that happens repeatedly and over time, this is a very efficient and rapid mechanism for getting rid of the, of the cluster stars. If clusters are orbiting in the, the halo of a host galaxy, you end up with something we call evaporation by two body relaxation. You see that here, so the stars here are gravitationally interacting with each other and every now and then, stars are being thrown out by that process, basically through a gravitational interaction. Um, this happens, it sets the structure of stellar clusters. It does not control their mass budget very strongly because it's generally a relatively slow process that takes time. And if we only uh, account for evaporation as a mass loss mechanism, you predict all kinds of environmental trends of the final globular cluster properties that are actually not observed. So for that reason, we know it must happen and it should be accounted for but we don't expect it to dominate. Now, both those tidal shocks that are showed on the previous slide and the evaporation that I'm showing here are included in e-mosaics. And we do that by measuring the tidal field tensor, so effectively the tidal field strength in each, along each direction. We measure that at every 
snapshot at every time for every stellar cluster, and then follow that for all clusters. Calculate how much energy gets injected into the cluster, compare that to its binding energy, and eject a proportional amount of the stellar mass within that cluster, modulo an efficiency uh, factor. And this way of doing that is consistent with the direct embody simulations that I just showed. So it's a subgrid prescription, but it was specifically uh, calibrated to reproduce the embody simulations that I just showed. Okay, so that then tells us, allows us to describe how the stellar clusters lose mass and allows us to go to the stellar cluster population at the end. And that is what we've initially done with the mosaic. So as I mentioned, initially we had 25 cosmological zoom-in simulations of Milky Way mass galaxies and their satellite galaxies. And of course, that's the point of the project, they're globular cluster populations. We've run many hundreds of such simulations switching on and on off different physics to understand what the role was of each physical mechanism. So for instance, what if across cosmic history is always exactly the same fraction of stars that forms in stellar clusters? Or what if it depends on the ambient gas pressure as I showed a couple of slides ago? So we've been trying all of those different things to understand really fundamentally how these affect the final demographics. And then in addition, and we now finish that, on the right here, you see a 34 megaparsec volume on which we uh, basically applied exactly the same model. And this volume contains 80 Milky Way-like galaxies, as well as a Fornax cluster of galaxies, is the massive structure you see forming here. And that allows us now to get even better demographics. So that is extremely exciting. So there were two main results coming out of this, uh, this experiment, basically. The first is that Indeed, we reproduced most, by far most, the observed demographics of the globular cluster population at redshift zero. Not all, there are shortcomings and we know where they come from. But because we reproduced those demographics, the first result coming out here is that most globular clusters are indeed the natural outcome of regular plus cluster formation at high redshift. And the reason is, is that one is that E mosaics reproduces young cluster populations. We get the right cluster formation efficiency, initial cluster mass function, and also the age distributions. Then second, we also get the properties of most globular cluster populations, most of these older extreme clusters. So examples are we get the right number of globular clusters per unit galaxy mass. We get their right radial distributions around galaxies, the right kinematics the right age distribution, and also the age metallicity distribution that I showed briefly. <clears throat> we get the high mass end of their mass distribution right, not the low mass end, and there's a good reason for that that I'll briefly mention at the end. We reproduce global clusters sitting on the stellar streams of satellite galaxies that have been tidally disrupted. The fraction of former global cluster stars that are now gone from the global clusters or in the field, that number is reproduced too. So this is really encouraging. It's, it's a good beginning. And of course, then what you learn is when you go into the direction of one, where things fail, and two, when you go in the regime where observations may not have gone yet, and you can make predictions. And a really interesting prediction is we can now try and see where and how the global clusters actually formed. And that's work I'm showing here by Ben Keller. This is showing a snapshot at high redshift of a galaxy that's forming, and you can see the filaments here feeding the galaxy, feeding gas, and also there's a smaller galaxy merging into this galaxy. And now we're marking what we have identified as globular clusters at ridge of zero, and we're color coding them by how they formed. So the circles formed within the host galaxy here, and they're colored by whether or not the gas was cool all the time as it fell in, or if it went through a shock, which might indicate feedback or maybe an accretion shock onto the galaxy. And then the squares did not form in this host galaxy. The squares formed in other galaxies and then were accreted. And most of them were not accreted during major mergers where similar mass galaxies merged. Most of them were accreted during minor mergers where a small galaxy came in and was sort of cannibalized by the host galaxy. And if we look at the entire population of simulations, we find that most globular clusters here in this pie chart, 60% formed uh, as gas that was accreted into the host galaxy that was never heated before. A small fraction formed in mergers, so it's not much, 
And if we look at the entire cluster population, we found that, that about 35 to 40% were formed in other galaxies and then accreted, and the majority again formed within the host galaxy itself. Now, this is not a prediction yet, because these numbers are hard to measure. But what you can do is you can make predictions for what the demographics of the young globular cluster population are going to look like at high redshift. And that is something that is now coming in reach with the James Webb Space Telescope. So with James Webb, we will be able to directly observe young proto-globular clusters. And shown here is the predicted luminosity function. So bright things are on the left here because of magnitudes increasing towards negative numbers. Or, uh, sorry. Magnitude or more negative magnitudes implying higher masses. Apologies, you can tell I'm a theorist. Um, and uh, yeah, this luminosity function basically tells us, as a function of redshift and therefore cosmic time, exactly when these proto globular clusters should have been bright and what their distribution should be once we start looking at them with James Webb. And I think this is really a critical prediction because, yes, we can reproduce what we see at redshift zero. But now we're also predicting what it should have looked like at the beginning and bridging these two things, not just with simulations, but also observationally, that is when we learn something. Okay, now to conclude, I'd like to briefly highlight how we can use globular clusters to learn about the formation and assembly history of the host galaxy. Because we have a framework of models here that does a reasonable job in reproducing the demographics at redshift zero. So, does it tell us something about how the galaxy assembled? And we naively would expect so, because what I showed throughout this talk is that the formation and the dynamical disruption of globular clusters depends on the galactic environment. It depends on the gas pressure, what the properties of globular clusters are at formation. And it depends on the tidal field, whether or not globular clusters survive. And it depends on galaxy formation, how they're redistributed. So we expect maybe some form of imprint of the galaxy formation and assembly process in the properties of globular clusters. And this is the second result of Emazaics, is yes, indeed, globular clusters can be used to trace galaxy formation and assembly. And the example I would like to use is the age metallicity distribution. I showed this briefly at the beginning, and this is now again showing the globular clusters in the Milky Way. So showing their age here on the x-axis and their metallicity here on the y-axis. And a really defining feature is, is this sort of bifurcation. There's a vertical type of branch of clusters, globular clusters, they're all old and have all kinds of metallicities. And then there is a branch where at a given metallicity, the globular clusters are younger, or at a given age, they're more metal poor than this other branch. And that is interesting. That feature turns out is extremely powerful. And this is just the Milky Way. But in Emazex, we've looked at this in all of our different galaxies. And I'm just showing six examples here on the right, with age again on the x-axis, metallicity on the y-axis. And the dots that you see here are the globular clusters in each of those simulations. So each of those, again, is a different galaxy, a different Milky Way mass galaxy. The contours show the age metallicity distribution of the field stars in those galaxies. So just the entire stellar population. Now, the first thing we see is that globular clusters show up at high contour densities. So if there are intense periods of field star formation in the galaxy, you also get a lot of globular clusters. And that is basically is just a byproduct of the fact that in emazaics, globular clusters are the natural outcomes of star formation. But then what we see is that there are differences. So some of those are extremely shallow, very gradual, like here, here in the middle left. Others are very steep, like here in the bottom right. And we find that those differences result from differences in the galaxy formation and assembly histories. What we also find in the simulations is that these branches that you see coming off, these low metallicity and young globular clusters, are not forming within the main progenitor galaxy, but they co they're coming from satellite galaxy accretion events. Because these are low mass galaxies, because they're lower mass, they can retain fewer metals, and their metallicity uh, is lower, so their metal content is lower. So what that does in principle, it allows us to link individual globular clusters to the type of galaxy that they came from, and that is really powerful. So just to illustrate briefly visually what I mean here, this is showing the merger trees. So these are kind of the pedigrees, the family trees 
of those galaxies, where the present day is at the bottom of each panel, and showing exactly which galaxies merge together. And what we see here is that the shallow example that I mentioned before, in the middle left, is a very sparse merger tree. Very little happened there. Whereas this steep one here in the bottom right has an extremely rich merger tree with a lot of rapid assembly. And that caused this galaxy to enrich in metallicity very quickly, go straight up, and then maybe evolve more slowly after that. So we see this direct mapping here between the assembly history and the age metallicity distribution. You can only get this from simulations. So I'll briefly skip to what we can then do with this. So this is showing such an example again uh, here, which is now showing the globular cluster population of the Milky Way again. So these are now the globular clusters of the Milky Way in this age metallicity space. And the background color here shows the mass of a typical galaxy in EMAs eggs that is forming clusters at that age and at that metallicity. And what we see is that we go up, galaxies get more massive. So it takes a massive galaxy to form a high metallicity globular cluster. It only takes a low mass galaxy to form a low metallicity globular cluster. And that is exactly the quantitative information that we can use. So what we've now done is we've used an artificial neural network to basically classify groups of globular clusters to figure out what the galaxy properties were of where they came from. And we've used EMAS X to train that neural network. We basically use the ages and metallicities of those globular clusters, as I just showed. These are important probes of how the uh, host galaxy assembled. But we also use, use the orbital information because clusters coming in from the same galaxy should share orbital features. And that is basically uh, what we did. So using these di distributions of the ages, metallicities, and orbits to then get out what is the mass of the galaxy that they formed in, and when did that merge with the host galaxy. Uh, what we find is there are five groups of globular clusters that we can trace to individual accretion events. And using this neural network, we can tell exactly how massive those galaxies were. And what we find is that the Milky Way experienced three massive mergers with three galaxies that have since been called Kraken, Gaia Enceladus, and Sagittarius. Sagittarius was already known. So these have similar masses. We also learn from the neural network that they merged at vastly different redshifts. So Kraken merged very early at a redshift of 2.3, and Sagittarius very recently. And because they merged at those different times and the Milky Way grew in between, we can calculate the merger mass ratio between the Milky Way and the galaxy that it merged with. And the galaxy that brought in the Kraken globular clusters, we find is the most major merger that the Milky Way ever experienced. And we can put all of that information together and reconstruct the merger tree of the Milky Way. And that is shown here. So the Milky Way is basically the structure here in the middle growing in mass. And all of those different accretion events are merging into that at certain redshifts and with certain masses. So this is for five of such galaxies that we can now reconstruct the Milky Way's uh, pedigree. Another 10 such galaxies are expected. And we're currently trying to find them. And this is the first time that this can be drawn. Previously, you could only really do this for simulations. And that is what makes this so exciting. Another thing that makes this exciting is that this Kraken galaxy that I mentioned was actually a prediction of Emus eggs. And no debris of that galaxy had been found. And as of this year, it now actually has. And that is, again, is giving us some confidence that this is all going in the right direction. And indeed, you can use globular clusters to trace galaxy formation and evolution. So that completes the circle here. That means that we have tried to address the question of how globular clusters formed and evolved, but then also use them again to trace how that initial phase of galaxy formation and assembly went. And as we go forward, we expect to expand this further over this 34 megaparsec volume. And I think what is really visually compelling here is this. This is the cosmic web now shown in stars, now shown in globular clusters. And that is really exciting, I think, going forward, that that is now possible. We will also keep pushing on uh, the physics in the simulations. We have a new generation of simulations coming that will include all of those physics, but with everything improved. And we hope that that will actually address uh, some of the shortcomings of EMAS eggs. The main one, which is, is that it doesn't have cold uh, structures within the interstellar medium. And with those simulations, we will address that.
So that brings me to the end, is the results, and, and I think a lot of this we've seen in the discussion over the past five weeks, that I think are the most uh, important steps that we've been able to make here, are that globular clusters indeed mostly seem to be the relics of regular star formation in normal galaxies. The environmental dependence of their formation and disruption means that their population statistics are sensitive to how the host galaxy formed. And by simulating that process and making that link explicitly, we can now finally use global clusters as tracers of galaxy assembly. And by putting together what we've learned from that, we've now been able to reconstruct the merger tree of the Milky Way from just these global clusters. And the hope is that the Milky Way is the first of many and we can actually extend that to galaxies across the nearby universe. So with that, I'd like to stop and uh, apologize that I went a little bit over. Zoom is always a bit difficult to, to gauge, um, but yeah, I'm more than happy to uh, have further discussion right now if there's time. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very thank much you. for coming and for listening. Questions? How, how do you organize the questions? People just talk or do you want to raise hands? What's the procedure? That, Sorry. Uh, yeah, I really am eager for questions from those in the other program. Sure, of course. For a moment to see. Go ahead. Fire away, Julio. Oh, thanks, uh, Lars. Uh, thanks, uh, Dirk, uh, for, for a wonderful talk. I was just wondering, you know, you use always pressure as this uh, thing. Well, you know, when we have high pressure, we form double clusters and and high, pre high pressures are you know, more prevalent in the early universe, and that tells you why low clusters are old. But uh, I mean, I can think of other places where there's high pressure astrophysically, like you know, the centers of galaxy clusters. And you, those are similar pressures to the ones you, you quoted, and yet mm -hmm. you don't see global clusters being formed uh, there. So are you just using pressure as a proxy for something else, for just you know, higher gas densities, so, or is it really the pressure that uh, determines things? And if so, why don't you see global clusters forming in the centers of galaxy clusters? Great question. Thank you, uh, Julian. Um, so, uh, it is largely pressure that I actually mean, uh, but it is the pressure in the cold interstellar medium. And be, because that's, uh, that's the first ingredient that needs to be satisfied is the medium that we're talking about needs to be susceptible to fragmentation, collapse, and star formation. And of course, in the centers of galaxy clusters, if the gas is hot, that is not going to be sufficient. So what we need is a supersonically turbulent medium that is cold. And when that is accomplished, then a higher pressure basically means that the uh, kinetic energy density is higher, the medium is more turbulent, and the uh, density contrast between voids and ridges becomes larger. So to put it differently, your probability distribution function of your density basically widens. So the density extremes get more extreme, and that is purely as a pressure effect. And that is the reason that in the end, I keep coming back to pressure. Now, there are other dependencies here that uh, in the uh, interest of, of uh, the argument I uh, omitted here, but even when accounting for them, the dominant uh, dependence is always on the, uh, again, cold gas pressure. Does that, does that address your question? Uh, yeah, I think that's, that's right. So basically you're talking about a, a particular phase. It has to be dense yes. enough and, and high pressure, but low, low temperature. And, that's right. And low, you know, low temperature for high pressure, so it means very high densities. So, okay. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Okay, other questions? Yeah, so can I ask a question? Please point of view of somebody who doesn't know anything about <clears throat> this. So it, the method, the numerical method you described combined with the neural network analysis seems uh, to have been, I mean, seems very effective and seems to be very successful at uh, simulating both the evolution of the clusters and then uh, how they can be used for understanding the evolution of the galaxies. Mm -hmm. Can you give some idea what are the next theoretical challenges here, mm. because, yeah. 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 
sorry, sorry, go, go, ahead, go ahead. No, no, that's fine. That's, that's enough. Yeah. Um, so, so the, the next challenges, uh, I, I think, are uh, on multiple fronts. And, and so, so one is that this in many ways uh, is, is basically is, is the beginning, right? The moment you start to have a sort of a reasonable working model for how global clusters form and evolve, that means you can start asking questions. Okay, how, how can we make this quantitative link between the properties of the global cluster population and the galaxy formation and assembly history? And there are just so many things we've not looked at yet. And, and I think that, that just doesn't just hold for this group, but holds for the field at large. And a lot of the conversation we've been having during this workshop was, for instance, about, okay, which properties of global clusters are the stronger, strongest tracers of galaxy assembly. I've just been using the age methodicity distribution as an example here, but there is information in the spatial distribution. There is information in uh, the kinematics. There is uh, information in, in just the age and the metallicity independently. And, and trying to understand that, I think is a major challenge uh, going forward. Another area in which uh, I think we really need to make progress is to improve the physics in these simulations. So the point I kind of danced around during this talk in terms of e-mosaics is that um, there are things that it does not reproduce. And it doesn't reproduce those observables because uh, the stellar clusters in e-mosaics don't dissolve quickly enough. And the reason they don't dissolve quickly enough is that it currently does not contain a very cold uh, interstellar medium. So the gas can cool, but then uh, there is, for numerical reasons, for computing time reasons, basically, there is a floor and the gas can't go further. And what that means is, is that the gas in galaxies doesn't fragment sufficiently. And that means the tidal perturbations that the clusters undergo as they orbit within the galaxy are not sufficiently strong. And that in turn means you need to play some other tricks to get that right. And uh, that is why I showed this example here, uh, whoops, here, uh, where we're trying to work on the future generation. And this actually is actually running uh, on, on the uh, computer right now, uh, where we have an interstellar medium that cools sufficiently far, which means the disruption uh, is fast enough and we do our star formation better, we do the, the feedback from the stars back into the surrounding medium better. And I think, you know, as, as, a, as a broad field, we're really making steps to understand all of the bits better and better all the time. But we need to bring it to something that I think comprehensively um, uh, is satisfactory, not just in one area, but in all areas at the same time. And the main challenge in that regard that I uh, mentioned at some point is, we don't just want to reproduce the global clusters at redshift zero. We also want to reproduce what they look like uh, at the time that they formed. And as new observatories can start to observe that directly, I think the theoretical challenge is predict it. What, what is the James Webb Space Telescope going to see? What is the 30 meter telescope going to see? And, and it's fine that those are still a couple of years away because those simulations take a lot of work, and I think I know there are many groups around the world currently working on their own simulations that make specific predictions. And I think that is probably the most promising: is that very soon this will not just be archaeology anymore, but we can do this at different moments in cosmic history and look at how uh, the basically the global cluster population formed as a function of cosmic time. Looks like Laura has a question. We're going to a question, Laura. Hey, um, hi there, Rick. Thanks for uh, an awesome talk. Um, you didn't mention this, but I, I, I'm interested in, in your view um, mm -hmm. on your updates on what is the angular momentum or the rotation of these globular clusters? Um, mm -hmm. Because my understanding is observationally they, they are really dispersion dominated, yeah. but one could think if the scenario for formation is this um, uh, sort of the, the coagulation into into clouds and then the shear, you, one would expect quite a bit of rotation. So how do we get rid of that? Yeah, that's a, it's a good question. And I, I think it indeed also came up during the talk. Uh, I mean, one of the experts on this uh, was actually at our meeting. I don't know if she's here today, but Annalisa Vari is uh, 
you know, one of the people who has done a lot of work on this. She mentioned um, some dependence on the stellar mass, but I, I wasn't yeah. sure how it works. So the, the thing is, is that two body relaxation uh, does tend to uh, er erase this uh, quite uh, so. Let me look for. Uh, well, the, I don't think you need to define the slide. Uh, I think the global question I think was building on what Ulrich asked is, is you know the global angular momentum. So obviously things internal. Um, so internal dynamics basically indeed erase that signature. If you look at the shear in, inherited maybe from uh, the host galaxy, that also gets, uh, a lot of that actually gets dissipated through turbulent motion. So you can, you, know, you can imagine spinning up a cloud a little bit and then as it contracts, you conserve angular momentum so it spins up. And there are environments where that is actually seen like galactic centers. In galaxy disks, it's the turbulent motion within those clouds and then the dissipation of energy and shocks that erases that a lot of that initial imprint. And then it's the stellar dynamics in the cluster that basically does the rest. I think that is, you know, in brief, is the current view on that. Awesome. Great, Great thanks. Okay. Well, thank you again. For